have with us Dr. Jesse Richmond of Old Dominion University. Uh, Dr. Richmond is an associate professor of political science and international studies. Uh, his PhD in political science came from Carnegie Mellon University, and he joined this area, um, ODU, in 2006 after teaching at Vanderbilt. He teaches American politics as well as research methods uh, for the Department of Political Science and Geography, but he also teaches game theory, statistics, and research methods for the graduate program in international studies at ODU. Um, he has authored and co-authored a number of articles on American politics um, and has served as an American Political Science Association Congressional Fellow from 2011 to 2012 and also completed a Fulbright grant in Budapest, Hungary in the fall of 2019. Um, he's had numerous appearances on national television networks, published opinion pieces with many different newspapers, both here and abroad. and has had many interviews across all media. We're very lucky to have him here with us today to discuss the most recent election here in Virginia. And at this time, Dr. Richmond, welcome. And I'll turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Heather. And uh, it's great to be with the league again. Uh, it's been uh, a little while since I uh, had a brief interregnum uh, but otherwise, um, it's, uh, it's been great, uh, to, to talk with you almost every year for the, a long time. I was looking back, um, and, uh, through my files and the earliest I could find, I think this might've been my first talk to, uh, this group was in 2007. And uh, so it's, it's been a few years that I've, I've been coming back and it's great to see some familiar faces who were, were there then and others who have uh, joined the group since. Um, today I want to uh, talk about the uh, recent Virginia elections and understanding those in terms of uh, issues, partisan composition, presidential popularity, electoral demographics, and so forth. Talk, touch briefly on uh, some issues with redistricting and uh, look at uh, prospects going forward politically uh, and in the state for uh, upcoming elections. And then of course, whatever questions you have, whatever direction you wanna take the conversation, we'll do that. When I look back through the files, this is a graph I found that I'd shared with you Back then, this was looking at the changing uh, political composition of Virginia back in uh, the uh, 2007 uh, time period. This was coming off of a state, some state level elections for General Assembly where Democrats had done pretty well. And uh, I, I presented a graph looking at a compilation of a number of different polls on the, the percentage of respondents to polls who indicated they were Democrats or Republicans in uh, Virginia. And noting a trend over a couple of years as President George W. Bush became increasingly unpopular, a trend towards uh, more support for the Democratic Party. And I said then in terms of raw party affiliation, Virginia is now a modestly blue state instead of a red one. Of course, Republicans then went on to have a very good year in 2009 after a very bad year in 2008. And, um, but uh, we've, we've had in the time since uh, some good elections for both parties. We'll talk about the, uh, the back and forth. I think the recent election outcome reaffirms that Virginia remains a, uh, a state which is a, uh, purplish state, blue tinge, but purplish. And uh, we'll talk about that. Hold on just a moment. The, the perils of doing this on Zoom instead of in a restaurant. Are you able to hear me? Um, 
I had uh, my five-year-old was knocking on my office door. He wants me to play with him and he has to wait. Uh, all right, so um, we'll, we'll talk about that. In terms of thinking about the partisan trends over the last several uh, elections, this is the electoral composition in the last four gubernatorial elections in Virginia, according to the uh, the exit polls. And you can see uh, 2009 was a, an exceptionally good year for Republicans. Uh, and then Republicans had a string of it, very poor years where, and this reflects what uh, we've seen in other polling, uh, the in the Hampton Roads area, the uh, Life in Hampton Roads survey has asked people about partisan affiliation for more than a decade now. And looking at that time trend, it's a similar pattern, a high in Republican identification around uh, 2009, 2010, and then a, a collapse in Republican affiliation, substantial drop off, followed by some modest recovery in the most recent survey. And you can see in the 2021 uh, exit polling it suggests that the there were still modestly more respondents who identified as Democrats than Republicans, but the Republican Party had rebounded from the low of 30 percent back up to 34 percent and a very narrow gap between the parties as opposed to the much more substantial gap in 2017. And so party identification of the state uh, has shifted. Uh, that's probably partly to do with presidential popularity. In 2017, uh, Trump was and remains unpopular in the state of Virginia, and that was depressing uh, party uh, support. But by the later part of this year, President Biden's approval rating nationally had uh, dropped substantially. And if you look at the exit poll among voters, 53% uh, disapproved of the job uh, being done by President Biden versus 46% approved. And uh, the uh, Republican candidate Youngkin did not fully consolidate that level of support either. You see less support here among disapprove than approve groups uh, and and this, that was driven by uh, this small segment of the uh, public which somewhat disapproved of the job being done by Biden uh, which kind of split its votes leaned towards Youngkin but not as dramatically as any of the other groups and so Youngkin was not able to consolidate that support but he benefited from the 44 percent these are basically the core Republican voters who strongly disapproved of Biden's job performance and uh, were solidly in line. Uh, McAuliffe got strong support, obviously, from um, the two categories on, on the left side, strongly approved and somewhat approved of Biden. And so part of the story, if you think about this, the uh, elections in Virginia, in November is that this was an environment not particularly favorable for Democrats. Democratic president, not that popular, party identification rebounding for the Republicans, all of that set the stage for a potentially uh, closer race than some of the ones we've seen recently. Uh, not necessarily the stage for uh, a defeat, but a stage for a uh, a tighter contest and a more difficult contest. Of course, I guess I, I should, I, uh, what happened, uh, I haven't said what happened, uh, all of you know, I, I suppose, uh, but we had uh, a close outcome within about a, you know, a percent, give or take, for each of the three statewide races uh, in which Republicans won the governor's uh, race, the lieutenant governor race, and the attorney general. And so the, uh, how did this happen? What what drove it? 
I think part of it was a failure of uh, the strategy of the McAuliffe campaign, which was aimed at um, identifying young Ken with Trump. And this was partly a turnout problem. If you look at the uh, people in the exit poll who said they voted for Biden or Trump, those are very closely aligned with the choice of McAuliffe or Youngkin, but you'll notice Youngkin had a little bit more of the Trump voters than Biden had of the, McAuliffe had of the Biden voters. Um, and then, but the, the big story here, I think in terms of this number is actually the uh, turnout story. Trump supporters made up 44% of the electorate. That's exactly the share of the statewide vote that Trump won in 2020. Biden supporters made up only 48% of the electorate. Biden won 54% of the uh, vote in 2020. And so there's a substantial drop off in turnout among Biden supporters. And that drop off in turnout is critical in terms of this outcome. Had 54% uh, of the electorate been composed of people who voted for Joe Biden, uh, then McAuliffe would be the governor elect right now. And so the, the strategy, the, this um, outcome, I think, reflects in part that challenge for McAuliffe of turning out supporters. The other challenge for McAuliffe vis-a-vis -vis Donald Trump is that although he based a significant part of the strategy when Biden visited uh, to campaign for McAuliffe, a lot of emphasis on the try to Trump. I got lots of mailers. Uh, I don't know if you did too. These uh, uh, endorsement announcement. Uh, Donald Trump endorses Youngkin. And you look, have to look in small type to find that this is an endorsement by uh, mailer being sent out by McAuliffe. The McAuliffe campaign did the work for Youngkin of making sure all of the Trump voters knew that Youngkin was Trump's man. But they didn't manage to do the sale in terms of convincing all of the voters who have an unfavorable view of Donald Trump that they should not vote for Youngkin. So if you look in the exit polling, among people who had a favorable view of Donald Trump, they went overwhelmingly for Youngkin. People with an unfavorable view, yeah, most of them voted for McAuliffe, but 17%, and this was a majority of the electorate that had an unfavorable view, it's 40% to 55% of an electorate that elected the Republican candidate, uh, only 83% voted for McAuliffe. And so there's this problem, this disconnect for McAuliffe uh, in terms of persuading voters that they should base their vote on their attitude towards Donald Trump. The, the effort to do that seems not to have succeeded in the way the McAuliffe campaign hoped it would. And I think this partly reflects the importance of other issues and the success of the Youngkin campaign in pushing uh, particular issues to the fore and, and also perhaps unanticipated consequences of the way particular issues played. So let's take an example. Um, one of the issues in this campaign was pandemic response, right? Why are we not in a restaurant, but why are we doing this call over our uh, over, over Zoom, right? It's because unfortunately for the last almost two years now, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has been reshaping American life in many ways and ending far too many American lives as well. And there were clear distinctions between the candidates in terms of the priority on various kinds of public health measures. And on the whole, on, on this issue, I think you see McAuliffe taking the more popular positions. So McAuliffe was in favor of vaccines as 
more or less was Youngkin, but McAuliffe wanted to mandate them and, and Youngkin not. Um, people, uh, hardcore vaccine resistant types who haven't had any vaccines yet by November, right? So these are people who really don't want them because the vaccines have been widely available for quite a while. A very small portion of the electorate, only 16% of the electorate. But the people who've had a vaccine, it, you know, the votes were pretty evenly split, so leaning toward McAuliffe. The people who hadn't had a vaccine were very predominantly 85% to 15% for Youngkin. And so uh, another another ish, another example, do uh, coronavirus employer mandates. Again, McAuliffe had the popular position, which was mandate employer mandates, uh, a good idea. And he got most of those voters. Youngkin had the less popular position, but he got a larger share of those voters. And that partially balances out the advantage McAuliffe gets from having the more popular position. And, and this reflects uh, phenomena that are um, well known, but perhaps underappreciated about how democracy works. Sometimes minorities are powerful if they're intense, all right? If, they're, if an issue is one they care about, they can sway things. Uh, and uh, just because a majority supports something doesn't mean that that's the winning side to take in terms of a political campaign, not always. Uh, Ostrogowski's paradox uh, demonstrates that you can potentially have a uh, winning coalition for a party in election when its platform has less than majority support on every single issue that the party has taken. I don't think we're looking at an Ostrogowski uh, paradox level context here, but, but nonetheless, this reflects the, the, some of the issues that can arise when uh, polling uh, with support on different issues gets combined as people weigh based on intensity how much how important particular issues are in shaping their votes. But there was another issue where McAuliffe managed to get himself kind of out uh, in uh, an extreme sort of position. And this hurt him uh, substantially. I think if you had to point to any one issue and any one gaffe that determined the election, it was McAuliffe's uh, statement and reaffirmation of the statement about parent non-parental involvement in children's education. Um, parental status wasn't all that important in terms of the vote, so I think it's important not to make too much of this, but nonetheless, I think something can be made of it. If you look at the, the exit polling, uh, both among men and among women, the percentage supporting Young can increase is higher um, for people with children, but the differences are quite modest in terms of the, the portion supporting uh, young can in each case. On the other hand, if you look at the exit polling, there's a question, how much parental say uh, should there be in what schools teach? And a majority of the public thought a lot. Another share of the public, uh, about a third thought some, and then 10% thought not much. And the Youngkin campaign worked hard to put uh, McAuliffe in uh, that box with a great deal of help from the candidate himself. Uh, this was the gaff that I think cost the election in the, um, in the second debate. So here's, here's an example of the ad that Youngkin ran uh, targeting him on this. You've probably seen it before. I, I apologize for you. Glenn Youngkin's taking my words out of context. Something you mentioned in Tuesday's debate is um, you said you don't believe parents should be telling schools what to teach. What did you mean by that? Well, first of all, parents should be telling schools that they want their teachers to be vaccinated. Do you think parents should have a say in the curriculum? You don't want parents coming in in every different school jurisdiction. You alluded to 
parents staying out of this. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're understanding you correctly. Uh, what is your stance on that as far as what school agendas have to say for the kids? First of all, this is determined by the State Board of Education and local school boards. And that's where it should be. Do you still stand by your position that parents should not tell the schools what they should teach? You do not want 25 parents picking books. Recall us reply. We have a board of ed and we have local school boards who make the decisions about teaching. And I'm not going to let parents come into school. schools. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. So this was... I think the, the equivalent of uh, a few years ago, there was a Republican Senate candidate who um, uh, got himself into a uh, major tangle and lost his race. Uh, I think it was in Indiana after a set of comments about how women don't get pregnant after a real rape uh, and so forth. Uh, this this was the, the sort of equivalent. Uh, McAuliffe got a lot of chances, as Youngkin campaign made it sound, at least in this ad, uh, to walk back the remark. And he didn't succeed in, in getting himself into the sum category in the way he needed to, I think. And it was a very close election. If I had to pick a single moment that shifted the race from a uh, McAuliffe wins by two or three percent to a Youngkin wins, I think it was that campaign comment and then the uh, the uh, bungled effort by the candidate in the campaign to walk that back and address the uh, the gap uh, quickly. I think people would be perfect. Uh, he just needed to get into the sum category. He let Youngkin put him in the uh, not much category. And that was a small share of the electorate. The, there's some interesting shifts in terms of demographics, at least according to the exit polls. And of course, exit polls are uh, limited snapshots and especially as voting modes shift exit polling is becoming much more difficult but um it, it would appear at least and we'll get better data as we get um better turnout uh, uh voter level file level data but what it looks like is there was a major flattening of the age distribution in terms of support for uh, Republican and Democratic gubernatorial candidates. In 2021, the uh, Republican and Democratic candidates, uh, you still saw the pattern where younger voters were trending towards the Democratic candidate and older voters toward the Republican candidate, but it was much more muted. Uh, 2017, voters who were uh, 18 to 24 and 25 to 29 we're voting for the Democratic candidate two to one. This time it was you know, 57, 52-47, 54-43, much, much narrower margins. And I think this reflects one of my one of my informal indicators of how campaigns are doing is their just the, the level of effort they're making. I'm sorry, I did I did you lose me on the call? Are you still able to hear me? No? Okay, just a moment. Then. We could hear you fine. That's good. I, I was it looked like I was having some issue with the phone, but I guess if you can still can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So um, an informal indicator is uh, the, the effort on campus. I, I sometimes call this my uh, pizza party indicator. Are the the um, the campus Republican organization giving out pizza and actively uh, organizing students, or is it the, uh, the campus Democrats organization that's doing that? And uh, after... A, almost a decade in which 
consistently the Democrats on campus organization was out organizing the uh, Republicans organization. This year it was quite the reverse. Uh, and I, I fault the McAuliffe campaign partly for this. The Young Kim campaign from very early on was working to find students who supported them, was hiring students as interns. The McAuliffe campaign was much less engaged, much less active. They they recruited uh, fewer students. Uh, I think I had three or four students in my classes this fall who were interns with the Young King campaign and nobody who was interning with the McAuliffe campaign. And uh, that's electoral malpractice in a situation in which young people have generally been more favorable to the Democratic Party. Uh, you have to make an effort to organize and engage uh, that demographic group. And it, it, it just didn't seem to be happening, at least on the ODU campus. The, this election continued some patterns that we've seen before. Uh, the, uh, there's a major divergence among uh, white voters on the basis of education. And so, according to the exit polling, uh, McAuliffe actually improved his performance in terms of the percentage of the vote, maybe not in terms of We've lost sound. Yeah. Good to know. I thought it was just me. Jesse, we, we've lost you. Hopefully, Dr. Richmond's okay, going to here, be here joining we go. us here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Yes. Welcome okay, back. Good. Thank you. I had uh, I was running the audio off my phone because that's usually more stable, but then uh, the phone ran into some kind of difficulty. So now I'm running audio off of the computer system, and uh, so hopefully this will work. Uh, continue. Uh, so thank you for your patience there while I dealt with that connection problem. Let me uh, let me just go back to uh, back to this. Uh, where were we? we were here. So there's there's this big gap that's developed in the last few years uh, in terms of the level of support for Republican and Democratic candidates among white voters uh, based on education level. Now you can see this uh, dramatically if you look at the contrast between both men and women. Uh, white women with no college degree, 67% supported Gillespie in 2017 and 74% supported Youngkin in 2021. Contrast with women who are college graduates, 61% supported uh, McAuliffe and only 39% Youngkin. Similar picture among men, uh, much larger levels of support for the uh, Republican candidate among men with no college degree compared to men with, with a college degree. No similar pattern at all seems to be present with um, 
uh, when we look at uh, people who are non-white in the Virginia exit polling. And uh, you, know, you see very similar levels of support for the uh, Republican and Democratic candidates uh, across levels of education. So this is a phenomenon among white voters currently. And uh, it's a, uh, an important aspect of the current political alignment. What happened to the political alignment, though? If you look across the state, uh, this map uh, shows where the gains relative to benchmarks like Biden versus Trump in 2020, uh, where Youngkin did particularly had the stronger gains and the weaker gains. And you can see it's kind of a washback of the sharp uh, rural versus urban suburban division in Virginia East versus West that developed under Trump. Youngkin didn't do quite as well as would be expected based on uh, the benchmarks in rural areas, but he did a lot better than would be expected in the DC suburbs and in Hampton Roads. Uh, so you see uh, this uh, better performance by the Youngkin campaign in uh, the more urbanized parts of the state and a, uh, a weaker performance uh, in, uh, in urban areas. As, uh, as uh, Zach mentioned in the chat, rural Virginia did used to be much more reliably blue. Uh, that was a long time ago in a previous political alignment ago. Uh, the current uh, alignment has rural voters as some of the more reliable members of the uh, Republican coalition. And uh, uh, this is this is not your not not the political alignment of uh, 50 years ago or 30 years ago. And I think you're right that, that it's partly because of changing party messaging. I wouldn't say it's just Democratic messaging, but um, the also the uh, messaging from the Republicans. Uh, Carolyn mentioned, interesting that uh, the Congressional District 5 is green compared to Southwest Virginia. Yeah, right. So there's, this, there, there's some areas that um, are also uh, a bit more rural, but uh, trending in the same way. You can also see little pockets here with other urban uh, cities and so forth within counties where you get that more dramatic increase, improved performance for uh, the Youngkin campaign. I'm not sure one can make that much of this, except that it, I think it reflects a uh, reversion to prior patterns a little bit uh, from the previous. This is still a case that you know, McAuliffe's best places were places like Fairfax County, and his Youngkin's best places were these places out in the, the rural parts of the state. But the, uh, the disproportionately Youngkin was improving on recent Republican uh, benchmarks in the more urban places. Now, one of the interesting questions in this race uh, was Youngkin's performance among Hispanics. You may have seen the young King, some Youngkin campaign people were trumpeting the uh, AP vote cast, which seemed to show that, um, yeah, I, I'd agree, Carol, Carolyn, it's a kind of flattening of partisanship, a little bit less. Now, there's still a lot of, there's still some big divergences. McAuliffe won Fairfax County by 25 points and uh, you know, 85 percent of voters in, in parts of Southwest Virginia voted for Youngkin. But uh, his, Hispanics have been particularly of interest in the last year or two. Trump made some gains among Hispanics in 2020. And uh, the AP vote cast, which is one of the big sort of quasi exit polling efforts, um, partnership with Fox News suggests that a majority of Hispanics voted for Youngkin. Uh, the Edison Research exit poll showed a substantial McAuliffe win, uh, two to one voting for McAuliffe. Uh, 
What's the actual story? Anybody's guess, both of these had tiny Hispanic samples and really not enough information to be able to tell. But uh, this is one of the things to keep an eye on heading forward uh, because not quite as much in Virginia, but nationwide, Hispanics are becoming a very important uh, demographic group. And the uh, question of whether Hispanics and other um, uh, minority groups st continue to vote uh, primarily for the Democratic Party or not is crucial for thinking about the, uh, the question that um, uh, the question of how the uh, changing demographics of the country will affect the political balance. Uh, Carolyn put in the chat, uh, Hispanic voters present a challenge to the redistricting assumption that minority groups can form coalitions to elect minority candidates. I, th I think you're, I, I think potentially, uh, one, one, of the, one of the questions uh, concerning uh, any redistricting plan is whether or not one can effectively predict how voters are going to behave in future elections. Um, I think there, there clearly are instances in which Hispanic voters vote as a block, but it's more limited than we, uh, the classic um, minority group voting as a block scenario. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, African Americans tend to vote overwhelmingly for uh, Democratic candidates. Hispanic voters have tended to support. Democratic candidates, but maybe by two thirds to one third. Uh, well, Carrie, I think in terms of uh, how Hispanics vote, depending on how long their family has been in the US, it's not just family, it's partly Hispanics is a really broad category, right? We're, we're lumping together people from all kinds of backgrounds and histories. And so there are big differences, for instance, in how uh, people of Puerto Rican background versus people of Cuban background uh, tend to vote. Uh, there are um, major uh, differences between, uh, we've, we have people, the Hispanics label gets applied to people coming from any one of um, a great number of different different places. And so the, uh, as we saw the, the attorney general, uh, incoming attorney general in Virginia is a Republican Cuban uh, American, right? And uh, Cuban Americans have tended to be uh, pretty staunch supporters of the Republican party. Many Cuban Americans migrated to uh, the United States uh, as a result of the Cuban Revolution, uh, and there's a strong tradition of uh, anti-communism that helped uh, uh, align Cuban Americans with the Republican Party during the Cold War, and those loyalties have persisted uh, to a degree. And so, uh, I think one one of so uh, there was a question on the chat: Does Virginia have more Cuban? Uh, uh, or origin migrants, the Mexican or Puerto Rican. I, I'm not sure what the exact breakdowns are. Um, I'd have to dig through the census data to try to fear, uh, figure that out. Um, right, and as Zach said, the, the fear for Cubans is uh, Dems equal Cuban communism. And I think you see something of the same pattern among Venezuelan, uh, recent Venezuelan migrants to the US who are also fleeing a, um, a socialist slash communist uh, regime. And, and that's been one of the effective appeals it would seem uh, from the Republican party to Hispanic voters recently. And this has been, uh, this has played into uh, the broader Republican line of attack on uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, kinds of restrictions. So, 
Uh, let's talk just briefly about uh, the House of Delegates races. Uh, 100 seats up in the House of Delegates, State Senate, zero seats up. Uh, state Senate races in Virginia only happen every four years, and this wasn't one of those years. Uh, there are 52 seats in which uh, on the certified uh, voting, uh, certified votes from the Virginia uh, Board of Elections, uh, Republicans held a majority. Uh, 50 of those are outside of the margin for state-sponsored recount. So there are recounts going on. Uh, probably in two districts, but uh, in neither case does the margin look close enough that it's likely that it will um, that it will change the outcome of the uh, of the election. So most likely we will have a very narrow Republican majority in the House of Delegates and a uh, Democratic majority in the state Senate, Republican governor, so divided government. One, one, uh, one uh, good thing I think in this election was that there was pretty robust electoral competition. Uh, both parties contested most of the districts, Republicans all but two of the seats, Democrats all but seven of the seats. And so both parties made a, a pretty good effort to fee field a candidate even in places where they didn't stand much of a chance to win. And some of those were places where they didn't stand much to win. This is just looking at the seats that were contested by both parties. There were, were some where the Democratic candidate won uh, close to 90% of the vote and others where the uh, Democratic candidate won just a bit more than 20% of the vote uh, in those, uh, those seats. So what does this mean in terms of policy in Virginia? It means uh, we, we're leaving this brief period of unified party government. We had uh, divided government for a long time, uh, ever since the, um, well, for, for about a decade. And the, situation uh, therefore means that bipartisan legislating is essential. Uh, if uh, Republicans and Democrats don't agree, things won't happen. Uh, yeah, as Zach pointed out, the state Senate is very narrowly divided. So one possibility is if Republicans are able to hold their majority together and pick off uh, a uh, couple of Democrats in the state Senate, uh, then they're in a position to be able to uh, to win. Uh, as Carolyn said, it's 52 at most in the House. That depends on these recounts. Again, the recounts are within the 50, the the half a percent margin for a state sponsored recount, but um, they're not. We're not looking at um, what we saw a couple of years ago, where an election race was determined by a uh, draw of names in a film canister, I don't think. These aren't that close. And uh, the history of recent recounts is that these have not, uh, these have not shifted the, uh, the margins very much. I don't think we're looking at a, a likely shift uh, big enough to, to have that effect. Uh, in terms of where the recounts are, as uh, Carolyn said, these are in Hampton Roads. Um, so one of them is in the um, 91st district and the other one is in the 85th. And the margins, the percentages are in the 85th, 50.17% for Republican candidate versus 49.73 uh, for the Democratic candidate and in the uh, 91st, it's 49.36 to 49.03. So these are close races. Every vote counts. Uh, and uh, we'll see uh, once every vote is, is carefully examined and recounted, uh, if those change, it's possible they'll change. I think it's unlikely that both change. So I think uh, it, we're looking at a 
majority for Republicans. Recounts, uh, how long do they take? There are probably people on this call who have more expertise about the recounts than I do in terms of how long they usually take. I think it's usually a couple of weeks. So um, we'll probably know by uh, sometime in early to mid-December what the final outcome is in each of those races. And so, uh, but there, there will nonetheless be some policy changes. Uh, Youngkin, a Republican, is now uh, in charge of executive power. I think there will be ch shifts in state pandemic response and prioritization. Uh, there probably will be some executive actions on education policy, some of them symbolic. Uh, what will happen in other areas? Well, it depends upon the ability to build an at least slightly bipartisan coalition and also about what happens in uh, national uh, politics. Uh, there's no majority for Republicans to push through a Texas style abortion bill, uh, but um, but they will we'll see. There's um, Carolyn mentioned in local referenda counties that voted for the GIP candidates also supported bond issues for their local school system. Many of these counties have fairly low tax base, so this was a vote to really dig deep to uh, support schools. I, I think one of the interesting things we saw in terms of the education messaging from Youngkin uh, is that uh, in, in his uh, victory speech, he emphasized, we're going to pass the biggest education budget in state history. Uh, given inflation and so forth, that may not mean actually the uh, that much of an increase for education, but the nonetheless, it reflects a willingness of voters to uh, to invest in various kinds of public goods. I think in in different referenda, there was also the referendum in Virginia Beach on flood mitigation, uh, where voters. Uh, again, decided to uh, spend quite a bit of money on flood mitigation strategies in the city. And uh, this was a, if you look, look across precincts in Virginia Beach, I wasn't able to see any kind of partisan divide on this. The precincts that were supporting Youngkin, the precincts that were supporting McAuliffe, uh, pretty much across the board, there was strong support for that, uh, that measure. Train changes in criminal justice. That's a good question. I'm, I'm not quite sure. The, a, a couple of years ago, it seemed like there was building bipartisan momentum for criminal justice reform. But I think that sort of ran out by the later part of the uh, Trump administration as uh, Trump was sort of leading Republican voters to a uh, policy of resistance to uh, uh, Black Lives Matter and calls for um, uh, things. Okay, the, there's also the question about vouchers. Uh, Asked because some GOP candidates, uh, certainly spokespersons have been talking about vouchers, tax credits, and diversions, public funding, and private schools. Um, that's back to education. Um, Okay, so where was I on criminal justice? I, I think there's some possibility for reform around the edges, but I think the momentum for uh, additional criminal justice reform has been uh, blunted substantially, uh, partly by uh, the highly publicized uh, issues in some cities with increasing crime rates and that sort of thing. Uh, school choice, so they're going, is there going to be a move to more uh, vouchers, tax credits, or other uh, diversions? I think Republicans would like to do that, some of them, uh, but I'm not convinced that they're going to have the votes for it. We'll see. Uh, I think probably we'll see some 
narrow nominal moves in that direction, but I'm not sure we'll get something larger or um, more substantive. Uh, those kinds of ideas have been on the GOP wish list for a while and to, a, to an extent, but I don't think uh, they're likely to get much democratic support at all uh, on those initiatives. And so it's probably going to be limited to narrow uh, pilot type programs. That would be my expectation. Uh, but we'll see. The pandemic has reconfigured the education landscape in a variety of ways, and we don't really know how enduring those will be. Uh, the uh, number of students being homeschooled, for example, uh, in various measures across the country jumped from one or two, maybe 3%, 4% to above 10%. That's a major shift. Uh, public schools, uh, a lot of parents in the Life in Hampton Roads polling expressed uh, significant concerns about the quality of education students were receiving during the pandemic and felt like that had declined. Does that create an opening for some kind of education policy reform? I'm not sure. Um, but it's, uh, we'll, we'll see. I, I'm, I'm dubious. I don't think, I don't expect to see major change, but, it, but I can see possibilities, maybe something. Uh, another, another issue, and it sounds like there's some people on this call who are more experts on this than I in terms of what happened, but uh, one, of, one of the major efforts, and I commend the League for its efforts in this regard, uh, in recent years has been to try to shift the redistricting process in Virginia out of the control of uh, the state legislature. We had a constitutional amendment creating a redistricting commission with a fallback that the state Supreme Court would step in to, um, to deal with uh, redistricting if the commission deadlocked, which it did. Uh, and uh, it's, I think it's unfortunate that the commission deadlocked. I, I, I wasn't, I, obviously I was not on the commission. Um, I, uh, so I don't know exactly what things were like inside the commission, but I hope that in the future we can find ways to maybe create institutional mechanisms to facilitate a process of more constructive bargaining. We seem to get end up despite the nominally um, nonpartisan general public members on the commission, a kind of um, partisan breakdown where uh, you, you, we ended up uh, with, uh, with a deadlock. What I, what I, and one idea I've been playing with a little bit is uh, to try to find ways to apply cake cutting algorithms to, uh, to the redistricting problem. And there've been some papers, uh, there's one uh, by some computer scientists at Carnegie Mellon University a couple of years ago talking about this. There's been a few other uh, studies and papers that people have put out recently. Now, the basic idea with a cake cutting algorithm is that uh, one can fairly divide uh, something like a cake, um, for instance, uh, between two parties with completely opposed interests by using a, uh, a, a plan where one of them gets to uh, propose a division of the cake and the other one gets to choose which uh, slice they want. So you know, if you're dividing a cake, you have agent one cuts the cake into two pieces that agent one equally prefers, and then agent two chooses their preferred piece. And agent one gets the remaining piece. And this it's not so simple to do redist with redistricting because you have lots of districts, right? And, and so uh, there are various ideas about how to translate this or how to get an effective cake cutting algorithm to work in a context where you have lots of districts. I don't think it's been fully worked out. Uh, one idea is a sort of um, process where each uh, party gets or each side gets to freeze uh, one district at a time. So the Democrats draw a set of districts, Republicans get to pick one district to keep or one or more districts to keep from that. Then the 
Democrats, then the Republicans get to redraw all the remaining districts and Democrats get to choose a district to keep and so forth back and forth until you have uh, all of the districts selected. Uh, this could result in some really poor quality districts uh, in terms of the last districts if the, the drawing turned out badly, I suppose. I'm not sure it, it, how easily it's applied, but I think it's worth exploring. We need the, 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 uh, the challenge is how to find a fair way to draw districts. And uh, I think the redistrict commission is a really important step, but we, there may be more to be done in terms of trying to get this to work properly. So what's to come? Short answer is who knows? Politics is unstable. Uh, the events happen, things happen. Uh, what can be seen at this point is that the 2021 outcomes in Virginia and New Jersey are reinforcing uh, the advantage Republicans already had in recruiting candidates for the 2022 midterm elections. Is this a realistic degree of optimism? Hard to say. It may be a little bit unwarranted. If you look at the generic ballot, the uh, Real Clear Politics average has Republicans trending up, up by about 4.2%. Uh, Nate Silver's organization, 538, uh, has uh, Republicans up by only 0.6%. Uh, this is about how they weight different polls that are seen as more reliable and less reliable. In no case are we looking at currently a division in the uh, generic congressional uh, vote polling uh, in line with uh, the, the large wave elections of the last couple of decades. Uh, we're not looking at the 11.5% the that Democrats had uh, had in 2006, or the 9.4 Republicans had in 2010, or the 7.3 that Democrats had in 2018. Uh, but of course, the Democratic margins in the House are very slim, so uh, that would suggest the probability of a loss is, is quite substantial. One caveat on that uh, is that Biden had no coattails in the House elections in 20. Uh, 20. This was a situation in which the House Democrats lost seats. That wasn't good for the House Democrats at that point, but on the but uh, one of the explanations for the midterm loss phenomena is associated with a surge and decline pattern. The lack of coattails potentially uh, insulates Democrats somewhat from uh, losses in the subsequent election. And so uh, where will things go? Uh, overall, we, we're looking at a continuation of what we've seen for the last um, uh, Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that question in a moment uh, in the chat. Uh, the country, people in poll responses continue to say that they're unhappy with the direction of the country. Uh, it's been pretty consistently for more than a decade now that uh, more people have thought we're on the wrong track than the right track by substantial margins, often two to one. And uh, that seems to be persisting. Uh, if you look at the average favorability ratings for US political leaders, everybody's underwater in terms of major national leaders, uh, both Democratic and Republican leaders. And so uh, I think partly what we see as well as the public not terribly satisfied with the way uh, things are going in the country, not particularly happy with any of its leaders, and uh, that potentially uh, continues to set the stage for uh, a, a fickle public. Carolyn wrote in, in the chat, to what extent did all the punditry proclaiming Virginia blue generate a reaction? No, we aren't. And could the same happen if the pundits now revert to calling us red? Uh, I think any pundit who calls Virginia red is uh, smoking something. Uh, it's no, it's a purple state. It's not a red state. Um, the 
and Republicans won by running an effective campaign and taking advantage of gaffes that were made by the Democrats. The uh, was Virginia blue? Yeah, it looked blue, pretty blue in, in a couple of elections, but um, the the patterns are um, the, the patterns are are not necessarily going to persist from uh, one election to another. There's uh, it's we're not living. Virginia is not California and Virginia is not Idaho. Uh, no, this is not a state that is, in the current party alignment is a lock for either party. It's a state that where Democrats have some advantage still, I think, but it's a modest advantage. And in a bad democratic year, that advantage is not going to uh, be sufficient to help Democrats win. And the advantage is slim enough that um, uh, a bad campaign can also uh, cause problems. Um, okay, so it looks like there are lots of questions uh, that people have. There are more in the chat. And I also, if you want to ask a question uh, by unmuting yourself and uh, speaking, that's fine too. Ophelia, why don't we go ahead and start with your question? Um, anybody who would like to verbally ask a question though, please put your hand up so that we can acknowledge you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Dr. Richmond, excellent information. Okay. Thank you so much. What I, what I need basically are your responses, your comments on two thoughts that I have that are very concerning to me. One is on um, the, the lore of supremacism and the other, the effect of uh, lying and on truth. I'll do the, the, the latter first. The Roberts Court ruling on stolen valor, that case basically held that lying was protected speech. I think this allowed a floodgate of media outlets to emerge such as Fox. What has happened now with this proliferation is that there is this toxic effect 24 seven, 365 days a year of destructive, pervasive, this insidious and apparently unstoppable uh, presence of untruths and just plain out lying. This level of um, influence to me is absolutely novel. I know that lying has always existed in politics, but this level and the, the, this, the, the constant feed 24 seven, a consistent source, I think is, is tremendously problematic. And the thing that bothers me most is that I think it, it is being in, ignored in favor <clears throat> of traditional analysis and business as usual, basically because we don't know what to do about it. So we look away from it. The effects of deceit, lying, duplicity, omission to me is seriously deteriorating democracy. And I'd like uh, a comment on that. The second, Okay. which is the law oh. of, of supremacism. I, I am a member of too many minorities, I think sometimes. I'm a naturalized American citizen. I am Hispanic, born in the country of Panama and growing up there, educated here in the United States. Uh, undergrad and graduate uh, school, I'm a, a black person and I am a woman. With that, I have been privileged, I guess, to be exposed to this, this sense of supremacism where in every single group, there is a, 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 a portion of, of the group that believes they are better than the rest of the group. Unfortunately, it's real and unfortunately it is consistently ignored. 
And one of the places where it, it reared its ugly head, the effects of this was in the 2020 election where Trump's numbers grew significantly among minorities. And even now pundits are baffled as to why that happened. I feel it is basically because of this tiny portion of persons in each group that subscribed to supremacy and found Trump as their avatar. Thank you. Sorry, it's so complicated, but I tried to, to make it as clear and direct. One, lying, and two, supremacy. Thank you. Well, thank you. Those are both uh, really important issues. I, I completely agree with you that one of the major challenges for us in uh, American politics and for American democracy is this tide of lies and distortion and untruth in in our politics and the really corrosive effects. I don't know. I, I've had the experience with family members and students and others or you know, people who are who have just bought in hook, line and sinker with uh, some distorted and not particularly fact-based uh, perspective on the world. And then uh, it's really hard to disabuse people of that. It's really hard to, to break through that, uh, to try to set them straight. And the current environment really doesn't help uh, one idea I have for something to try to do about this um, um, is to I think I think one of the challenges is we get these um, patterns in social media and elsewhere where people share things that aren't really true with each other, the news outlets that's that put those out and so forth. They and and the rebuttals to those ideas don't catch up with it, right? People get to, and they do choose to live in these ideational bubbles where you know, all, all they read is uh, conservative treehouse and uh, uh, listen to a few podcasts that are all sort of aligned with their political views or what have you. And, and then they're, uh, you know, that, that, distorts the perspective and I, I for example and I think this can happen on both the right and the left though as you noted um, arguably the problems have been uh, much larger on on the right and we had um, anyhow if you look at uh, if you look at politifact ratings over time the the portion of ratings uh, that are uh, false or pants on fire or so forth have been going up and up over the last decade and, and, and some time as, uh, as these patterns have been uh, building. So one idea I think, is, I wish Facebook would do something like this. Uh, allow people st allow people Facebook editorial could be partly involved with this they, they've done a little bit of this in locals uh, in some ways but from the top I'd like to be able to if I see something that somebody shares that I, I think there's a fact check that needs to be seen to that to propose a rebuttal here's here's something I wrote here's somebody something else wrote that takes down this argument that that deals with the factual inaccuracies and I'd like that to always, if, if that gets um, you know, sufficient upvotes or whatever, or, uh, you know, I'd like that rebuttal to always appear. If somebody shares the link to the original story, there's also going to be paired this rebuttal to it. I think we have to somehow, Jonathan Swift many years ago said, and I think it remains true, but but sort of multiplied in this current environment, uh, you know, the, the, the truth is, is around the world before the, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the fact falsehood is around the world before the truth has got its shoes on, uh, right? How do, we, how do we tie the truth to that falsehood so that it gets towed along and everybody who sees the falsehood gets exposed to the truth? And I think that's, uh, it's a major challenge. The, uh, yeah, maybe if, maybe if it'll increase his bottom line. I'm not sure if it would uh, uh, 
So, but, but anyways, I think that's that's a really important issue. Um, in terms of um, beliefs in supremacy as an explanation for uh, say minority voters supporting Trump. Um, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with reducing anybody's electoral choice uh, without, uh, I, think, I think minority voters, uh, voters of different demographic groups are made up, you know, these groups are made, like all groups are made up of a variety of people with different political views. And so, um, yeah, one of the factors may be uh, supremacy. Certainly there are pretty good correlations between racist attitudes and support for Donald Trump in uh, the election surveys. Uh, so that would seem to support the idea. But uh, as, as we were talking about earlier, one of the uh, another of the factors in the uh, appeal to uh, Hispanics has been uh, this uh, sort of anti-communism uh, language. And, and uh, I don't think that's specifically about supremacy. I think that's about uh, economic policy uh, fears and concerns. So it's I, you know, it's complicated. I think there are different facets of what motivates uh, people to vote in particular ways. So I'd say it's part, but it's I wouldn't. I don't think it's the whole story. Right, it's not the whole story. And there's a religious aspect where there are Catholics and Evangelicals in significant numbers in the Hispanic community who subscribe to subscribe to anti-abortion versus pro-life. Yeah, and, and if you look in uh, Brazil, it looks like possibly in Chile, right, they, there's some uh, there right-wing populist movements in uh, parts of South and Central America uh, to match what we've seen in the US. And so, uh, that's uh, it potentially makes sense to see similar appeals working for uh, people in both uh, in both sides. One of my uh, you know so so that's uh, that's part of it. Okay, lots of other questions and comments. Um, can somebody else pick out which one? To, <laughs> there's there's so many here. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, um, Carrie's got her uh, hand, you have hand a up. Question about mm -hmm. um, in the chat. A recent article was published on demographics in Virginia and report on large economic disparities. How do you, Carrie? Would you ask that because I'm not sure. How do these demographics affect the politics? Is that correct, Carrie? Yes, that's correct. I have another question as well, but yes, go with that okay. one first. <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure I understand the question. Could, could somebody restate it? So there was recently a report on economic inequality, and I'm actually trying to find the actual question in the chat again. Okay. Um, uh, but large economic disparities in Virginia, and how do you see these demographics, the economic disparities affecting the politics? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think the increasing economic inequality in the United States is one of the root drivers of the polarization we see in American politics. And this happens in a variety of ways, some of them uh, subtle or even counterintuitive. Um, there, there's a very strong correlation if you look across the 20th century between economic inequality and the level of partisan polarization. Uh, and it seems to have continued into the 21st century. We've had increasing political polarization uh, in the United States and in Virginia, and we've had increasing economic inequality. The The, party, the parties themselves are not simply parties of 
um, sort of up, uh, poor and rich, right? If you, the, the, the party coalitions are not really structured on the basis of income right now in the way that, uh, that one might expect given uh, some past political history. The, uh, the last several presidential elections, uh, income has been quite a weak predictor, still a predictor, but quite a weak predictor of uh, vote choice. Uh, these kinds of cultural issues and so forth uh, cut across uh, income levels in, in various ways that can be fairly complicated. And um, they, uh, they have um, effects that, um, you know, as, as we talked about earlier with uh, religious issues, uh, these can lead voters to vote in ways that aren't necessarily uh, aligned with what one might expect. So I think the inequality is there. I think it's one of the sources of the tensions in American politics. Uh, and I think if it continues, it, it uh, is likely to be very corrosive to our society. Uh, I think reducing inequality would likely be uh, good for calming our politics if one could do it uh, in some kind of uh, ready and effective way. But it's um, some, it, it's uh, in some ways the, the class divide right now is a latent divide, divide almost in American politics and a party system which seems to be increasingly defined by a set of uh, cultural issues, a set of uh, issues that really have only a tangential connection to uh, economic class. Okay. Uh, we do have one last question in the chat. Um, okay, this is great. from Vicki Greco. Um, returning to the subject of public public education, misinformation messaging is a big threat to privatization slash disinvestment efforts of public ed, you know, i.e., oh, who could be against school choice? Mm -hmm. um, and considering what's happening at the local level with vocal, you know, a vocal volatile minority of constituents applying immense pressure and threats to local school board members, could this also translate or, you know, can we see this at the state level with state legislators? And well, this, this gets to the question of whether, I, I was somewhat dismissive of whether there'd be major education reform in this uh, current environment, political environment in the state. Yeah, there, might, there may be efforts to bring pressure. Uh, and I think, I think it's quite plausible that the, uh, the support for school choice will grow and that this could become ultimately uh, something that gets uh, more support in the, in the state, maybe uh, policies enacted. I don't see it happening in the next year or two. I'm, I'm dubious that it will happen, but yes, there may be efforts to bring uh, major pressure to bear. I think uh, that's possible. Uh, state legislators are, uh, are responsive to pressure. Question about censorship. censorship. Um, yeah, it seems like, uh, Public school and public university. Well, we just uh, I, mean, lots of different things people are, are putting out there. Um,
Janice, you've got your hand up and, and a question posted. Um, or a I, pose a, I pose a question because I'm also of Latina descent and a multicultural background, but mm -hmm. people forget that people coming from the Latina um, cultures, we don't, we don't really subscribe to the one drop rule as Americans do. And that's also forms a whole different sex, sex and discussion as far as colorism coming in. So when people come into the country, especially some countries were also under oppressive rule and see fear the police and government like Nicaragua, Ecuador, and several other places that San Denisus, when you think about those histories and even in Haiti going into part of that culture too. So when a people hear that, that the government wants to interfere with vaccinations, school systems, and um, more or less um, try to, to force their opinions on it, this brings back bad feelings. So, and then also a lot of people in America do not know how to classify Latinos. They, they, because if you know the history, how they populated and changed the dynamics, they imported a lot of Europeans to lighten up the country. But the largest population of Blacks outside of Africa is in Venezuela, Brazil, and the heavy Cuban culture, a lot of those cultures. So they list them. So when Cubans came to Florida, they were heavily discriminated against. So they thought it was better to subscribe to white, not being under the one trap rule. So this is why you have a lot of people that don't want to be at the bottom that are perceived that way. So they vote Republican. That's not necessarily a choice, but it's a, it's a survival mechanism as well. Thank you. That's a great set of insights. And I, I agree. I think that those are some really important uh, things to do. I think um, there, there's a risk for both political parties to um, uh, for leadership to work on the basis of uh, very simplistic yes. assumptions and to fail to engage uh, effectively and to not understand the full spectrum of concerns and interests and so forth. And um, uh, that, uh, that's, a, I think, a challenge and an opportunity for both parties uh, how do they how do they effectively uh, communicate with uh, this important and growing segment of the uh, voting public? And I think right now there's so much fear because I think Donald Trump pushed what was what people were thinking and kept quiet to the forefront to more or less more division. So now, um, a lot of these these um, ideas and it's becoming more segregating, separated, but the opinions and far right and this one feeling this way, I think that didn't help the situation either. Carolyn wrote in the, I, I, I agree. Uh, Carolyn wrote in the chat, it's been said that people vote for their self image, not their self interest. Uh, what do you think? Uh, yes, I, th I think I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, if if you want to try to predict um, how people will vote, uh, their identity as uh, and their political views uh, are more important predictors often than uh, uh, some. Uh, kind of economic self-interest, for example. Now I'd push back a little bit about that dichotomy though. I think that um, what, is, what is someone's self-interest? Uh, we could define it very narrowly in terms of what's going to be good for, uh, for my pocketbook in the next year, right? How am I going? Am I going to be better off? That's one of the things that shapes voting, but it's not the only thing that shapes voting. People care about uh, a lot of other factors often. Um, and so uh, is for people who care deeply about the abortion issue on one side or the other, many of the people who care deeply about that don't have an individual self-interest stake. 
uh, in that question in terms of whether it will affect them in the next year, most likely. But they care very much about it. It's an issue of conscience. It's an issue of uh, public policy and morality that they that influences their their votes. Uh, I'm kind of inclined to see that as uh, people. I don't. I don't know that it's a self-image. I'm not sure it's a self-interest. I think people are broader and. Uh, the the influences on how people vote are, are somewhat bigger than merely self-interest uh, or simply self-image, but both of those matter uh, along with uh, their views about what's the prudent policy course, uh, their perceptions of the consequences of different uh, choices, uh, their political ideology, uh, their conscience, all of those matter too. And they're, they're connected to self-image. They're connected to self-interest often, but, but uh, they're not fully dictated by it. Carrie. Carrie, you're on mute, hon. Maybe the hand, maybe the hand's just up accidentally. Well, I, I'm going to yeah. have to go. I, I'm going to have to go pretty I'm soon. I, uh, oh, here we go. I'm not. I'm unmuted now. Fine. Uh, sorry about that. I thought I almost lost everybody. Um, the uh, Elaine Luria's um, staff during the our election day had gone out and did some polling, and when they did did the polling of the people who were showing up at the for voting, uh, they said that everybody that they were running into or talking with were very angry. Um, and I, I think that drives a little bit of people going into who, the election, um, but does it drive people in towards a certain way? Now, I, come back to the last slide I, I put up. Right. For more than a decade, almost all the time, a solid majority of Americans has agreed that the country's on the wrong track. I don't think they've necessarily agreed about how to get the country on the right track, uh, but they've they've agreed about it being on the wrong track, uh, the direction of the country not being uh, good. And so I think that anger is is a and fear uh and so forth are are important drivers in american politics in in recent years and i don't think they've lost any of their potency and the kind of isolation and the disruption so that many people have experienced as a result of the pandemic has only accentuated uh that i think in in some ways and fraying some of the uh traditional social bonds that people had uh enjoyed and been part of and so um, i hope we can find some effective way to to resolve these these challenges to get to a place where maybe uh at some point we'll again have a majority of the country thinking things are on the right track it's been a while since that's been uh an enduring perception in the country and it it certainly would be nice if if we could get there Thank you, Dr. Richman. We really appreciate you uh, staying with us over time to make sure that everybody's questions got answered today. Um, and thank you everyone also for your participation and interaction. Um, you know, this was a, definitely one of the best discussions we've had year to date as far as what's been going on with our electorate and the I guess you could say the political environment. So once again, Dr. Richman, thank you. Um, we know you have a five-year-old who's <laughs> waiting on you to be done today. Um, so everybody, it was great seeing you. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody again soon. And I hope everybody has a great weekend and a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Uh, next thank month, you. it's the second Saturday, not the third. 
Yes. Next month, we're going to learn about um, tracking legislation this Saturday, December 11th. And to all the members that are with us, please make sure you read your newsletter that comes out every month um, because you would know that our general meeting, if you had opened it and read it, our general meeting is going to be in January this year. Um, so please continue to refer to that and our website for all the current events. All right. Thank you so much for Thank having me. Always, back. always fun to be here with you. Bye, it was bye. great having you back. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. bye. Have a happy holiday, everyone. Thank you. You, you too, too, Janet. And please be safe. Thank you. You too. Bye.